My name is Brian Labus. I'm the senior epidemiologist with the Southern Nevada Health District. And in the Office of Epidemiology, we're responsible for taking foodborne complaints, investigating cases of foodborne disease, and investigating foodborne outbreaks. There are a number of different pathogens that can actually cause foodborne disease. Some can make you sick rather quickly. Other can take weeks uh, to actually develop symptoms. So it's not necessarily the last thing you ate. More often than not, it's something you ate a couple days ago that actually made you sick. You're just seeing the symptoms now. When we evaluate what made a person ill, we consider uh, where they ate, where they purchased their food from, as well as their behaviors and the food that they cooked at home. Uh, people always think it's the last thing they ate that made them sick. It may be a restaurant they dined at several days ago, or it may be something they cooked at home. In a lot of the investigations, it turns out to be something that they prepared at home, uh, had the same problems that a restaurant would have, for example, and the foodborne illness was caused in the home, or was something spread from another family member who had a foodborne illness. There are a number of different pathogens that can actually cause foodborne illness. Each pathogen has a different incubation period, different foods they're commonly associated with, and different symptoms. The majority of foodborne illnesses result in gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, typically a vomiting and diarrhea. Many of them have a fever as well. And those are the main symptoms people think of with a foodborne illness. But there can be a whole range of other symptoms as well, something like a hepatitis, where you get jaundice, uh, your skin or eyes turn yellow, bloodborne infections, and a lot of other different problems. For the vast majority of people, they get the illness, they get sick for a few days and get better with no long-term consequences. For other people, they can have serious long-term problems and some of these illnesses can result in death. As with most diseases, the people that are very young and very old are more likely to wind up getting disease if exposed to a pathogen because of weakened immune systems. In addition to that, those are the groups that also have the most serious side effects. One major concern with a gastrointestinal illness is dehydration, which can cause very serious problems uh, across the board, but in somebody very, very young, can be a very serious consequence that could result in death. The majority of foodborne illnesses pass rather quickly. People wind up being sick for uh, one, two days, up to a week maybe, uh, with this type of symptoms of vomiting and diarrhea. And, and when you have those sort of symptoms, to take care of yourself, uh, the biggest focus is on staying hydrated, not getting dehydrated from losing all that fluid. So drinking plenty of liquids uh, to keep that fluid in your body. As with just about every other disease we talk about, washing your hands is the best way to keep yourself from getting sick and spreading that disease to others. To get these sort of foodborne illnesses, you need to swallow something that's been contaminated. Now you can't control it if the food's already contaminated, but if your hands are contaminated and then you eat that sandwich or swallow the apple, uh, that's how you wind up getting sick. And so the best thing you can do to keep yourself from getting sick is washing your hands before you eat. Uh, and the best way you can prevent others from getting sick is washing your hands after using the bathroom. We receive uh, 700 complaints on average a year of foodborne illness from the public. In investigating those complaints, it's usually very difficult to figure out exactly which meal caused the illness. The pathogen in most of those cases isn't identified, so it's very difficult to figure out what they're sick with and then figure out what actually caused that particular illness. There are a number of different pathogens as well. Those are reported to the health district and we are able to investigate those more fully uh, if you go to your doctor, for example, and are tested for a certain disease. But for the majority of foodborne illnesses that are reported to us, we're unable to figure out exactly what that source is. When somebody calls in a foodborne complaint, we take information about everything that they have eaten in the last 72 hours. We want to know what restaurants they eat at, where they shop, those sort of things, to try to get a better idea of what the potential source of their illness is. If that complaint is a follow-up to a laboratory diagnosis of a disease, we can evaluate it a little differently. But for the majority of complaints, we're looking for connections between that individual complaint and other persons actually making complaints. When we find those sort of connections, we can begin investigating, uh, go out and do evaluations of those facilities, and start to look for additional cases of disease. There are three main groups involved when we do outbreak investigations. First, we have the epidemiology staff who are responsible for working with uh, ill persons, trying to figure out who's sick, describing their symptoms. We also have environmental health who goes out and takes care of the investigations in the facilities, looks at the food practices just like they would in a uh, basically an enhanced uh, investigation like they would do in their normal inspections. And then we have the laboratory who assists us in trying to figure out what's actually making the people sick. For more information, you can see the Health District's website at www.snhd.info. Uh, we have information about foodborne disease as well as links to other resources.